All right. Um, so as we usually are doing these days, we'll do a quick um, testnet check-in. So yesterday, um, Charlie initiated a reset of the testnet sometime around noon. Um, and I think Ludo had post posted earlier in the morning, maybe around 10 or 10.30 in the morning, Eastern time that uh, we were still um, several hundred blocks away from the configured exit height. Um, and if we had let that run, I think the nodes would have exit sometime like very late Sunday night. Um, so anyways, uh, Charlie initiated the reset uh, and then the nodes had not like gracefully exited on their own. So, so there was just some miscommunication. I think he was under the impression that, you know, he was supposed to do the reset at noon on, on Sunday, regardless of um, uh, what was happening on the testnet. So there's, you know, I followed up with him and I think uh, there's clarity now, but I think it just suggests that we probably need like a testnet reset playbook that we follow consistently, like some series of steps uh, that we are doing each time. Otherwise, I think we just have a little bit of thrash that happens on Slack every time we do a testnet reset, you know, whether the sidecar needs to be reset, whether the database needs to be wiped. Um, so that's something that um, uh, I can follow up with the DevOps team on, but just want to do to give people or at least let people know that this happened. The other interesting thing, so on Friday, uh, most people here were on this call um, with the DevOps team where we deployed a new miner that was not going through the firewall and that seemed to fix the issue of um, slow block production that we were seeing um, and, and essentially like this bursty traffic uh, with the Bitcoin D node. So, between that new miner being deployed until the reset on Sunday, a uh, number of burn chain sorties were back in the 120 per hour range. Then on Sunday, when the reset happened, uh, we did not deploy this new miner. And the sortation numbers are still at you know 120 per hour. Um, so, so I don't really know what's happening here or if anyone sort of has a good hypothesis for how to, how to explain this behavior. Uh, so, so you can see, you know, we're consistently producing about 120 blocks an hour. Um, so, so yeah, if people have ideas, thoughts, um, Jude, I, I saw your email, so we can talk about that as well. Um, I think the stacks block rate production itself is about 85 an hour, which is what I remember we were at um, in, in Neon as well. So um, I don't really have any commentary on that. Just wanted to share this here if people have any reactions. Um, so let me pause here, see if people have any comments. Um, Jude, if you want to just catch everyone up on the changes um, that you made uh, and you mentioned in your email. Sorry, what, is the, what do you mean by stacks block rate? Being a Oh, I, I'm just looking at the stacks chain height and dividing by that by time since re the last reset. Um, so I think like one reason we would maybe expect that like post reset, um, we wouldn't need the like non firewall miner, um, is that like two things happen following the reset. Um, one is that, um, a bunch of nodes that were just like maybe sitting and connected, uh, get disconnected. So we would have less load. Uh, immediately following the reset. And then the second thing that happens is that um, the Bitcoin node has to respond to way fewer messages because there are fewer Bitcoin blocks. Um, yeah, although we didn't see that behavior on Thursday when we did Thursday's reset, like on Thursday, when we did the reset, immediately after the reset, we, we almost immediately oh, yeah, started yeah. Seeing, seeing the sort of slow block pressure and the bursty traffic like all of those symptoms were visible immediately. Yeah, that's true. So then, uh, yeah, maybe, <laughs> maybe there's no explanation there. Um, though it may be, I, I mean, traffic might just be, like yeah. there might've been just fewer people running nodes. Cause like, I don't yeah. know how many nodes were you, we're actually even seeing on the test net. Like I would guess like maybe somewhere between eight and 20. Um, yeah. And if like four of them are run by, like us on our local development machines, there's more of those running on Friday than on Sunday. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, the other thing that did happen is um, I think the DevOps team cycled out at least one of the VMs that had been problematic in the past. So there might be like some underlying hardware changes that have happened, uh, which we, we don't fully know. So that's the, the only other factor that I can think of. Um, anyways, uh, Jude, do you want to go through the, the changes that you, or the things that you find in your investigation from yesterday? Sure. Uh, so this weekend I spun up a local version of the Argon testnet. Um, by that, I mean, I had a, my own Bitcoin node, my own firewall node and sitting between, so the firewall, I positioned my firewall node such that it received all inbound and outbound traffic between my stacks nodes and the Bitcoin node. Uh, so I had two stacks nodes in addition to this. I had a miner and a follower. Um, I discovered that, I discovered a couple things. Um, there were a lot of time wait sockets, a lot of TCP sockets that were not being properly shut down and would just have to expire through the normal two minute delay in normal TCP behavior. I um, noticed that first of all, and I also noticed that the firewall was not properly um, freeing up its sockets when the when the one of the downstream stacks nodes closed it on its end it would eventually close it after a after a uh, 30 seconds timeout of of the socket being idle um but due to the bursty behavior of stacks nodes after they do their initial sync um by that i mean by that what by that i mean they will um reconnect to the bitcoin node very frequently they'll open a socket ask for headers close the socket open the socket ask for headers close the socket etc that can lead to the firewall having a lot of sockets open that aren't doing anything. Um, they'll eventually get expired, but using just my two nodes sitting at this steady state behavior, um, I managed to see the firewall have as many as 40 open sockets where there should just be two sockets. So that's pretty terrible. Um, that's now been fixed in master. Um, the firewall will now uh, properly shut down everything um, the reason this was happening in the past is that when a stacks node connects to the um, firewall in order to get blocks from the Bitcoin node, the, the firewall opens two sockets, one to the Bitcoin node and one to the stacks node. Um, and then one of those two sockets was not being freed, probably the one to the Bitcoin node when the stacks node closed its end. So uh, we probably should do like a new deployment of the P2P firewall yes. pod immediately, right? Yeah, as soon as possible. Um, yeah. this could have led to some problems. Like, um, if you hit the file descriptor limit on the VM, um, it would not, ref it would not take any new connections and that could lead to, um, bursty looking behavior, um, from nodes trying to fetch data through the firewall because the socket connection might just time out or it might work yeah. for a few seconds and then time out. Um, another way this could manifest is the, uh, memory usage on the firewall can keep going up and up and up as there's more and more unfreed, um, uh, unfreed socket state in the kernel, as well as unfreed uh, forwarding state inside the firewall. I don't know if this was the cause itself, but I'm set, but I think that might have been a contributing factor. Right. Okay. Um, so, so we can ping the DevOps team after this meeting. Um, any other comments, thoughts on the test? And the only other thing I wanted to flag is. Um, you know, we, we still have the exit at height set to 8,640 blocks, um, roughly three calendar days. So given the reset yesterday, the next reset is coming up on Wednesday. Um, and I just wanted to ask if uh, we should bump that up um, to maybe like a week, uh, if there's a good reason to keep it at three days versus a longer time interval. I feel like from a stability perspective, you know, bar barring some of the infrastructure issues that happened last week uh, with the VMs getting pulled from under us, um, it seems like there is marginal utility in, in very frequent resets at this point. Do you think we could boot, um, boost the uh, requirement to 100,000 sortitions from 10,000? I mean, we, we haven't actually cleared 10,000 sortitions yet. <laughs> so, oh, okay. <laughs> because I mean, most of the, uh, you know, because we've been having these block production rate issues, we actually haven't had reached a chain height of, of or at least a stacks chain height of 10,000 blocks ever so far. And towards that then. Yeah, and the burn chain height is, you know, it, we we are guaranteed not to exceed 8,640 blocks based on the current configuration. So um, at the very least, pushing bumping this to seven days will give us enough time to, you know, reach a longer stacks chain. Um, 
Yeah, I don't know how long, let's see 100,000, how long will that take? Um, anyway, so any any opposition to bumping it up to a week? Um, so that would be a week after tomorrow's reset? Uh, Wednesday, the next reset is on or Wednesday. Wednesday, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, so after Wednesday's reset. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I would be in favor of that. Um, the only the only like opposition I would have is that like we we haven't actually hit one of these resets yet. Well, I mean, we did hit it on Thursday. It was just, um, I mean, the restart procedure was not working, and so oh, we, I see. I see. Yeah, so so actually we hit it on I think sometime on Wednesday, and both nodes had exited. Yeah. The restart process was not working, so we had to manually reboot things. So. Gotcha. The nodes have gracefully exited. It's the rest of the stuff that's that hasn't been ironed out. I see. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Okay. I think this requires a code change. Can we make this configurable, Ludo? Sure. Yes. Okay. All right. I mean, anything. It, it, Sorry, it, it, it's already configurable. So oh, it is. By, yes. Oh, I see. I see. So we just need to make a config. I I thought that we. So let me rephrase. I thought uh, in some previous um, Slack message or somewhere else you had mentioned that people who are running nodes um, outside uh, will have a default exit height of you know same three days. Yeah. And. <laughs> And is is that is that a default that's specified in the config? Is that a default baked Correct. into the code? No, it's it's in the config, but the config are not centralized, which means that every single miner has its own config. I see. Uh, so so, the, so basically, the next reset that we do, um, we we should just make sure everyone is restarting their miners with that new configuration as well. Correct. So they should be. Yeah, maybe pulling master or yeah, just updating okay. their own um, configuration. Okay. All right. Anything else with respect to the test net before we go to the board? All right. Um, so on to the board here. And so the current sprint is ending. Today, I think tomorrow is the first day of the next sprint. Um, so after we review this board, we can um, go over items that are already tagged to the next milestone and I will bump everything that's left over here into the next milestone as well. Um, so we, we have a lot of items in review still. Um, I think Pascal's PR Ludo has reviewed it. I think Jude just reviewed it, left a bunch of feedback. Um, so I think we're just waiting on him to update the PR at this point. Yeah, I think that's right. Okay. Um, and then, uh, yeah, I saw some reviews for Jude's PR. It looks like Jude, you're gonna fold in some more changes into this, or maybe you've already updated the PR. Uh, has, um, sorry, go ahead. All feedback should be addressed by now. Okay. Um, I think this PR has been sitting around for quite a while, so I, I would re request people to go over this. Um, let's try to get it merged um, so that we can pull in these changes into the in time for the next three seven Wednesday. Okay, so that's this. This is. Is this part of that PR as well, Jude? Let me just read this real quick here. Yeah, that should be addressed. Okay. Um, the bug was that uh, I noticed this during a chain reset where a node will um, continue where a node. So each, so, sorry, a bit of background here. Each node maintains a cached block inventory um, from what it believes its neighbors has. Um, but the way in which that inventory is updated is through a bitwise or. So if a node had reported it previously had a block, but no longer has a block, for example, that block is considered invalid because it's no longer on the longest chain, um, it stays set marked as present in the stack's node's local inventory. 
Um, it's not a block, it's not a show stopping bug though, because the node will only ask for blocks that it believes exist. So even if another node reports a block is present, if the local nodes um, inventory um, suggests that there is no block there, it won't ever ask for it, but at least it's some pretty confusing log messages. Like it dumps its inventory to the log and it shows a bunch of blocks are present, but there's no way that could ever exist. Um, this fix here just makes it so that the uh, bits are set back to zero if the node reports the block as being absent when, it, when a uh, local node refreshes a remote node's block inventory. Yeah. All right, so these are all part of that same PR. Um, what about 1576, Ludo? I, I know you made some updates. Are you blocked on getting reviews? Are you still uh, no, making sorry, more changes? I, I, um, no, I, I, I'm done, but I just saw this morning that the tests were not passing, so I, I'd be fixing that and then adding some reviewers. Okay. Um, have you looked at this new show? I mean, we'll do like a, a triage of the new issues, but there was an issue where um, I think it's Pascal again. Uh, he's hitting a, a reproducible panic at a very specific block number. I think it's like 65,000 something. Um, Always suspicious when it's close to a power of two like that. Yeah, 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 yeah. So I was just wondering if, if that could be related to the changes you're making or we suspect it's a completely separate issue. It might be a different issue. Okay, all right, we can, we can discuss it when we review the open issues. Okay, so this one is technically still not in review. Um, hopefully we'll get there. Let me actually just move it back here. Um, 1582, where are we on this one? This one also has been sitting in review for a while. I need to approve it still. Um, I was hoping to, maybe it doesn't have to happen right now, but I was hoping I could merge this um, as part of the uh, uh, minor PR, but I don't know. I mean, if the PR is ready, I feel like at this point, if you have a bunch of PRs that are just sitting in review and they're, they're, you know, these are all non-trivial PRs, we should try and merge them as soon as they're ready. Otherwise, we'll just have like more. The kind thing of is, it would, it would, if you merged it as is, it would probably lead to a lot of breakage for other PRs that get merged to master because it's a pretty wide ranging change. So uh, let, let me try merging it locally against my upcoming minor PR. That would probably be the one of the safer ways to do this. Or we merge to master right now, and then we merge the network PR, or we fix the network PR so that it doesn't, it will build correctly. And then we merge that. What do you guys think? Um, uh, I was gonna say, I think just like in general, like we should try to merge PRs to master quicker and then like if they're if PRs are going to conflict like we should resolve those conflicts in the PR like one of the PRs should merge the other one should merge the conflict and then yeah like I, I think just like keeping PRs in an open state because of potential conflicts later on I, I think is it, it requires a very high cognitive load because now you're just managing these like potential conflicts in your mind. All right, go ahead and merge it. I'll I'll make I'll review it in the end of the day. I'll review it by end of the day. All right. Thanks, Jude. All right, let's uh, come to the in progress column. Um sixteen sixty two. Is this merge already? Is or is it just in review? I think it's uh, just in review. And then these still remain in the backlog, right, Jude? That's correct. I'm going to try to get them done by the end of tomorrow. OK, I'm just going to move them to the next milestone. Assuming that I don't get pulled away for uh, testnet related things. Yep. Okay, we talked about this one. Um, hmm. Has anyone looked at this issue? Uh, no, I did not. 
Did we talk about this last time, Ludo, and, and you had said that you would look at it because I see you're assigned to it. I'm trying to remember if we did that on purpose. Sure. I was assigned 14 days ago. Mm. All right, I'm going to move yeah. it to the next milestone, but it would be good if someone can at least take a look and confirm sure. if this is a bug or not. Okay, I'll do it. Um, okay, I think Ludo, you had opened this one. Is there? Oh yeah, I didn't never heard back from John. So I'm gonna remove the milestone from here completely and I will just follow up with John. Let me actually send him a note right now. So we will let him respond. Okay, looking at the next milestone, what do we have already? So there is some in progress stuff. I think we reviewed these already. All right, we don't have a ton of stuff tagged for this milestone. So let's look at all the things that are new. You're just folding this into your PR, right, Jude? Yeah, you're muted. Sorry, uh, that's in review. Okay. Yeah, this is the bug that um, we were talking about. Has anyone had a chance to look at it? Not yet. No. All right. Who who wants to take a look? Uh, if it's Magneta, I can look into that. What about this one? Has anyone had a look? Have any reactions? Um, yeah. Uh, I don't know. Like uh, this. This seems. pretty close to bike shedding. Um, <laughs> like uh, returning the modulo uh, from the remainder is quite straightforward. Like it involves just calling the like absolute value. Yeah. Uh, so I don't know. Uh, we could implement two different functions here. Um, so that it is maybe more in line with uh, other lists. Yeah, um, I'm. In the the thing that struck me in this um, issue was the fact that there is there is a crate for us that implements modulo. I mean, that's not surprising to me. There's <laughs> ten ten thousand crates for us. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah. I came to PM and said, "Hold my beer." <laughs> <laughs> but at least Russ doesn't have a left pad. <laughs> at least. Yeah. <laughs> Yes. Oh, don't worry. There, there's going to be at least three of them. There's going to be one that's completely safe, one that's completely unsafe, and one that claims to be safe but has a crap ton of assembler just for the X eighty six sixty four version. <laughs> All right. So it seems like we don't we don't really want to engage here. I'll, I'll see if there is a. I can just follow up with Terry offline. Um, yeah, I mean we. 
if he wants to submit a PR that implements two different functions, like we we can happily review it. Like I don't think it would be that big of a deal if our mod function always returned a positive integer. Like I don't yeah. think that would be surprising to people. Um, and it wouldn't break any existing code. So yeah. um Since we're talking about clarity issues, let me just talk through this first. Um, would, would we put this in the same bucket or is there like meaningful change here? No, I think this is more, much more meaningful. Um, like the way that we describe literals in clarity is problematic basically for exactly the reason presented here. That like yeah. you can't have a variable that starts with a U followed by a digit, um, which it is a surprising grammar. Yeah. Um, so is this something that we we want to take on? I know Aaron, you had mentioned a suffix-based yeah. approach here. Um, yeah, uh, so I would be in favor of a suffix-based approach for specifying literals. Um, the related problem of doing uh, literal inference um, can be handled somewhat separately um, if we move to a suffix grammar. Uh, yeah, and then I think this one is also kind of conflating you know, whether we should support unsigned ints as a first class thing at all. Yes, yeah, yeah. Um, Seems like at the very least, we should like tease apart those those issues and, and figure out what we want to tackle. Yeah, definitely. So like, I think that we probably should move away from using uh, prefix for our integer literals. Um, yeah, this is a little bit more problematic because this is a breaking change. Yeah. Um, basically every contract everyone has ever written will be broken because of this. Um, so we use a lot of unsigned ints. Um, yeah. So I, like the way that I, the way that I'm thinking about how we can roll out breaking changes for clarity is that like, we should probably have another branch for staging uh, clarity changes. So like mm -hmm. something akin to a master um, for like it, all the code, but the clarity code is essentially the same as what whatever is in our default branch. Um, but like we, we don't want to be continuously merging PRs that have breaking changes. Like we want to do that more on a cadence. Yeah. Um, yeah. Any, any other input? Ludo, Jude, any thoughts on this one? I don't think it's ever in question that we were not, that we were going to do unsigned and signed as first class types. Um, but I agree with Aaron, it's probably a suffix. Like now is the easiest time to make any changes that are breaking changes. It will only be harder tomorrow. It will be even harder next week and it'll be impossible after making that. All right, so how about this? I'm gonna assign it to Aaron for now. Um, and we're targeting as this print, um, and then we will, or the sprint that's starting tomorrow, and we will go from there. Um, the idea of having a staging branch for just clarity is pretty interesting. Um, should we talk about that in a more general sense? Um, because this kind of dovetails with this uh, notion of trying to separate out the clarity VM to the greatest extent possible from the rest of the code base. Like up to and including making yes. a build target for it. Yeah, uh, I mean, the, the way that this would work most easily is if these things were like separate modules. Like we could version the Clarity module, and then the Stacks blockchain default output would just like have a Clarity version. And whenever we bumped that, that's when all the breaking changes would happen, um, because. Yeah, that, so I think that that would be like a perfect world, but like getting there is more involved than than just introducing a new branch for 
for the time being. So like we could have a branch that like we plan to merge two weeks from now that merges a bunch of these breaking clarity changes. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, I don't know. What do you think uh, about that, Ludo? Uh, sure. Yeah, that sounds good to me. But uh, do we have any other uh, breaking changes in mind? Um, so I think um, there's a lot of stuff around tuples. Um, mm. Right. That I think that we've been wanting to do for a while, but haven't. Mm -hmm. um, and then there's other things related to integer types, um, things like uh, specifying the max list length. Like currently, you supply mm -hmm. it an in integer, but like really, it's an unsigned int, like mm -hmm. behind the scenes. And yeah, I don't know. Mm -hmm. so I think that we should expect to be making, I think, plenty of breaking clarity changes over the next two months or so. Sounds good. Yeah, and, and we do have a, a meeting um, between the blockchain team and a few other folks um, from the, the DevX team um, to, to just talk through, like, are there other clarity features that we want to incorporate before the mainnet, including, you know, breaking updates, um, and then we'll kind of do a similar exercise um, with Algorand as well. Um, to, to yeah. come up with, you know, a good list of things that we want to incorporate before the main launch. All right, moving on, 1672. Oh, this is the, the PR that Aaron had that says the... the yeah, the, I was just uh, like also, looking at the content of that. I was like, what is this issue? <laughs> so uh, maybe more generally, um, is there like a, a same set of defaults that we should apply on all of the sockets that you know we end up opening from the SAX node? Like right now, I think on the PR, Aaron mentioned that if we don't set a read timeout, the default is an infinite timeout. Like it'll just block forever. I mean, uh, the more fundamental question is why are the reads even timing out in the first place? It's not mm -hmm. like the Bitcoin node is getting that much load on it. Yeah. Um, yeah, so I, I think that this, this like PR masks an issue that we want to resolve. Yeah. Um, but at the same time, I think that your question is still like valid, like as a client, you should set timeouts, um, because you don't necessarily know, like you, you don't want to misbehave if you have a misbehaving server. Um, so like we probably should have some default timeouts. Um, I'm not sure if like this PR is the way that we want to implement those. Um, like whether it's configurable, what have you, I think we should have timeouts. So. Yeah. Sure. Um, we can make like a, you know, generic, a general way to build like a default socket with the default connection options from the default connections options struct. Like that's certainly doable. Is, it, is there like um, a would, factory pattern in our code? Like, well, is there like- Walker, I, would, I specifically did not say a factory pattern for a reason. Um, that reason being twofold. Uh, first, different, uh, the, the connection to the Bitcoin node, the, pro the properties of that connection and that generally speaking, the network of Bitcoin nodes are going to be different from that with stacks nodes. Sure. Um, the second thing is that the Bitcoin socket is a blocking socket and the, the code base is designed around using a blocking socket, uh, whereas the system for the, the, the rest of the system um, uses non-blocking socket operations. And due to um, weird design choices from the Rust team, um, different socket options are available depending on whether or not you use a blocking socket or a non-blocking socket. So doing a factory is actually mm. somewhat difficult. Mm. Or, I mean, it sounds like if we do want to go down that path, I'm, I'm, I'm just using that word because I'm familiar with that from Java land. So whatever the equivalent of of Rust is, but it seems like, you know, um, if we do want to use a pattern like that, at, at the very least, we'll like need two different factories or like some way of configuring them for like, you know, these different socket types. Um, anyways, I, I'll let you guys figure out like what is the right way to implement this, but it seems like we're in agreement that we should have like a standardized way of 
constructing these sockets that sets the default options depending on you know whether we're using blocking versus non-blocking sockets um that's already true there's exactly two places in the code where sockets are created one of which is in the um, source net poll and one of which is here in the bitcoin indexer so you're saying that we just need to update those those call sites with setting the options yeah okay so should we file a, a new issue for that? And, sure. and maybe just abandon this PR? Yeah. All right. And I will let you close that uh, pull request. I'll just note down this action item. Okay, we talked about this one already. Um, thanks for sending out this PR, Ludo. Are you? Is this ready for review? Uh, no, I have to. Uh, I have to. So I did the first draft, and so I've been uh, implementing the Prometheus integration in the text node uh, module, and mm -hmm. we talked about that on Wednesday. And so we want to move the integration on the. Text blockchain uh, okay. library uh, instead. So I, okay. I need to do the changes and uh, do the actual wiring. Okay. All right. Uh, we talked about this one. What about this? Has anyone reviewed this? Is it just like a documentation issue? Um, no, I, I, I think there's two issues here. So one is that the Lisp entry type takes an int when as max lane takes a u int. Mm -hmm. um, so that's like kind of an inconsistency. And I think that there's actually another issue opened by Pascal about unsigned ints being used for entry the max length of lists. Oh. Um, I don't see anything unless we've reviewed it before. Oh. Yeah, maybe not. Maybe he just commented on that issue. And he brought it up in Discord. Mm. Um, and then the second issue that docs, oh no, this is Pascal's issue. I see. Mm -hmm. Um, the second issue, the docs issue. Um, yeah, that's just the docs issue. Like we should document what the max clarity value is. Okay. So that, that seems like an easy fix. We should just do it. And then in terms of this inconsistency, um, should we just like fold it into the other issue, like if we're going to remove unsigned nets, for example, like this problem will just go away. Right. So we, we wouldn't remove unsigned ints, but if we do um, integer literal type inference, mm -hmm. this issue would go away. Like you could define the list type signature with yeah. either integer uh, suffix. Okay. Um, so yeah, so that's probably what we should do. All right. Yeah, which, yeah. Um, Terry A also uh, mentioned. Okay. Um, I'm going to add a comment to this um, in GitHub in just a second. Um, all right. I think we talked review. about this last time as well, right, Jude? Yep, it's in review. Okay. Wait, it's in review. But it's part of your PR? Yep. All right. Um, okay, let me mark it here and move it to review. There we go. Uh, 
And what about this one? Is this also part of your PR? No. Okay. Did we discuss this last time? I'm trying to remember. I think we did. Okay. And was the conclusion that this is like a good optimization, but like not critical right now? Yeah. Okay. Uh, can fix it later if time permits, but it's not stopping us or breaking anything. All right. Um, you want to talk about this one, Jude? Sure. Like, I request has been kind of a thorn in my side on my local dev environment because it keeps failing to build, and I had, end up having to make the local changes to its uh, um, its build settings, and it's also um, yeah, not that good of a piece of code in general. It's got lots of unsafe code. It doesn't yeah it pulls out oh. a lot of dependencies. Um, I don't think we're going to need it come mainnet either, um, in part because we don't really make use of any of its services beyond talking to the Bitcoin, um, the Bitcoin node and beyond using it inside of tests. We use it for the event dispatcher. I mean, that's, that can be easily changed. Yeah, I, I agree. But that's the, uh, I think that's the primary. Okay, um, so it's primarily used there. Then, if that's the case, then we can strip it out easily. Uh, so, so one thing I did uh, got rid of request. I mean, I, I replaced request with H one in my Prometheus uh, integration. Mm -hmm. um, What's H one? Uh, I think H one. Uh, that's another package I want to get rid of because it's okay. again has tons of build issues. Like I have to manually downgrade the. the the uh, the package in my local cargo to get it to build. Mm, I see. Okay. So like, just not, as it... but to be clear, that's not a problem necessarily. That because uh, Prometheus is a feature flag anyway. Mm. Yeah. But in general, is is the recommendation, Jude, that like for all HTTP needs, like whether client and server, like we should just use the the client and server that you built for the p2p layer and if anything is missing from that like we we enhance that instead of pulling in these third-party libraries yeah i think that would be preferable um there's a nice technical win that comes out of it um in addition to getting rid of a bunch of dependencies and that is it gives us a uh the ability to globally manage things like number of open sockets or number of like or request buffer sizes other sorts of network shaping parameters mm -hmm. that you don't really get from something like request. Like for example, if we discover down the road that using request causes us to DDoS the event, the event sync, we would be, there wouldn't, there's not very much we could do about that, like short of trying to find some way to implement um, application level buffering. Uh, whereas if we used our system, we could, we have much more fine grained control over it. Does that work for, for everyone? Like, just want to make sure that, you know, as a team, like we're saying that this is, this is the path that we want to go down. I mean, I think if we're going to be using the HTTP code for our peer to peer code, like we should be using it other places. Like the event dispatcher, I think is like sort of like lower, um, has like a lower impact on the overall system than our peer-to-peer -peer code does so no no i understand i guess yeah. like i was trying to ask like there is we are implicitly making commitment that you know the the http client and server implementation that we have like we'll actually continue to improve it and add features to it that maybe you know the reason why we are not using an event dispatcher when we first implemented it is because it's likely certain things were missing from that implementation right and it's just a commitment that i want alignment on I'm committed to doing it myself. All right. So is this something that we should slot for? Like, we definitely want to do this, right? And as Jude was saying earlier, like some of these changes, the sooner we do them, the, or the more we wait, the more painful they'll be. Mm -hmm. So it should be, should we try to tackle it in like a specific sprint, whether it's like this, the one that's starting tomorrow or the one after that? Um, so I would almost say that the earlier we do this, the more painful it will be mm. um, because 
the event dispatcher is likely to have a number of changes over the next month yeah. as like the sidecar wants stuff and like adding new endpoints and things like that uh, via the SourceNet HTTP module is much more painful than doing it through just adding request endpoints. Um, whereas like whenever we do this change, like we'll know sort of exactly what endpoints we have. We're, we're not, we're gonna be updating them less frequently. And so it'll be like kind of like a one-time pain as opposed to like, if we do it now, like it, it could be really painful, especially for the sidecar team. Yeah, I agree. I think requests, that's why I said the thing is fine for now. It's good for prototyping and figuring out what exactly we need to have for the sidecar. But once we're ready to go, we should make the change. Okay. Um, just want to make a note here. All right, so we can come back to it. All right, I think we've gone over pretty much everything at least once or twice. Um, so we'll come back to this. Okay, I think that covers everything that I had on the agenda. Anything else folks wanna bring up? So I can, I can ping the DevOps team for this action item. I think Ludo now there is a Docker file as well, right? That, that we can use to do a build. Uh, we do have a Docker file, but I think we should start versioning uh, deployments. Yeah. So, yeah. So we just need to just tag a, a release in the P2P firewall repo? Yeah. Okay. Jude, can you do that? Then we can let the um, all right, and I can file an issue for this one. Cool. All right, well, if there's nothing uh, else, sorry, uh, go ahead, Lou. Yeah, sorry. Um, should we create some issues for the uh big refactoring we talked about like are we, are we starting this work this week yeah i think we probably should create some issues um like i i can go through and create uh, a bunch of issues um yeah okay. probably works better than us trying to decentralize the create the issues <laughs> Sounds good all right, and then and uh, maybe just tag them against this milestone uh, just so that we have them all in one place. Yep. All right. Cool. Well, thanks everyone.